phenomenon we're gonna talk about are fairy rings. It's basically a naturally occurring ring or arc of mushrooms. The rings may grow to over 10 meters in diameter. The more the fungus grows and seeks food underground, the larger they get. So for thousands of years, whenever somebody saw a fairy ring on the ground, they were immediately scared by them. And what's so freaky is that these rings can appear literally overnight. They can travel from one location to another, they move. So for example, if you see a fairy ring that's here one day, the next day it might be like over here and no one knows how it happens and that is why it is deemed so magical and scary. There are many warnings about these fairy circles, especially in Western Europe. In France, people call them sorcerer's rings and in Germany, people call them witches' rings. This is because a lot of people believe that these rings were made because witches gathered in a forest. Old Dutch superstitions state that the rings are where the devil churns his milk. What does that even mean, churns his milk? <laughs> the beliefs in Austria claim that the legendary rings were created by dragons. So people all over the world believe different things about why these were made. For the most part, the myth involves fairies or supernatural creatures dancing around the ring, or the ring is a portal between our world and the fairy realm. It says, do not, in capital letters, stray into a fairy circle, or you will be transported into the fairy realm and will have certain doom. People imagine fairies as these happy, loving creatures, but actually, if you look into the myths of fairies, they're very dangerous creatures. They don't like humans, they're mean, they're evil, and if you transport into their realm, they will end you. It says, if you dare enter a fairy ring, many myths warn that you will die young. You will also become invisible to the mortal world. You will be unable to escape the ring. You might even lose an eye for being so foolish. And you will be forced to dance around the ring until you die of exhaustion or madness. So these are all very terrible punishments for stepping into a fairy circle. It says if you step into one accidentally, there is a way that you can reverse the curse. It says to avoid this terrible fate, you must run around the ring nine times, but it has to be during a full moon and it has to be in the direction that the sun goes. But it says if you accidentally go around the ring 10 times instead of nine, evil will befall the runner, is what it says. So what's really creepy is it says that if you're alone and it's a very quiet day and you approach a fairy circle, you will most likely be able to hear them speaking. So you'll hear whispering, you'll hear small amounts of music. It's scary. And apparently removing a fairy circle from your backyard is very, very hard to do. It requires digging down several feet or more to get all of the infected dirt. It says if you happen to spy on one on your own lawn or come across one while hiking, be very careful and watch your step. You can listen for the quiet sounds of laughter, but do not step inside the circle. There's actually a large amount of people who not only believe fairies are real, but genuinely want to know how to contact them. Belief in the existence of fairies appears to go back as far as the 13th century. And I've actually made a ton of videos about fairy history, so we're not gonna be going into that today, only how to contact them. So if you wanna see a fairy in real life, keep watching. All right, to start off, you have to declare that you're only interested in seeking out friendly fairies. Because while it might seem that all fairies are just precious and sweet and wonderful, that's not always the case. Just like humans, there are fairies with a lot of different personalities and there are such things as evil and dark fairies. So unless you're looking to speak to the dark and scary and difficult fairies, you need to go out and say, those with bad intentions are not welcome here. You need to make it loud and clear so those ones go away and you're only attracting the good ones. Next, you have to travel to their home environment. While summoning a fairy into your home is certainly possible, there's a higher chance you'll see and hear fairies when you're outdoors. Those who have contacted fairies before say they live in nature. So whether you're out in the middle of the forest or simply out in your backyard garden, you need to surround yourself with trees and plants and flowers. You need to be immersed in nature. While you're outside, find a nice tree to sit underneath. And as you sit with your eyes closed, you might try bringing out a flute and playing it for just a minute. You actually have a better chance of going out in a forest with a 
an instrument because fairies love music, they love nature, and that combination is just really good. The only kind of flute I know how to play is a recorder from school, and those things don't sound very good. The next thing you have to make sure is that you're not wearing any of your clothing inside out. Turning your clothing inside out might actually drive away any fairies you might encounter. So make sure to double check your shirt, your pants, your jacket. Apparently if you're wearing any of your clothing the wrong way, it will drive them away. Isn't that so strange? The next thing you have to do is dance and sing and rid your house of any negativity. If you want fairies to come to your house or into your house, it's important that they're entering a positive environment. And one way to create that positive environment is to sing songs and to dance. Now there are quite a few different chants you can say to bring the fairies to your home, and this is actually a real one, okay? It says, fairies, the child in me, let's happiness be, push away dark clouds, let joy flow free. Imagine like all the fairies just like attack me right now. So if you say that in a singing voice while you're like dancing around, they will come to you. It also says that if your house smells of like cigarette smoke or you have a bad relationship or there's just toxic negativity in your life and in your house, fairies don't want to be around that. Next is to leave them food offerings. Apparently fairies are very food motivated, just like a lot of creatures are. So leaving out some of their favorite foods as offerings appears to go a long way in the attempt to speak to these creatures. Apparently those who have met fairies say they like to have raw chocolates, candies, cakes, ginger, and barley. Apparently they're attracted to all of those things. Others say that simply putting some honey in an accessible place is enough to make fairies willing to make contact. Some people put out a little bowl of honey on their front porch on a full moon and apparently that brings them in. Isn't that strange? Next it says to clean your home so it's not full of clutter. And that kind of goes along with the whole negativity thing. Your house just needs to be a positive clean place. It's not enough to simply tidy up. Fairies are apparently attracted to clean spaces. So you may have to go as far as to scrub the dirt off the floors and really make sure that everything is sparkling. It even suggests to bring out some essential oils. Fairies love a good, nice smelling place. A very strange one is that it says to remove any iron objects from outside of your house or inside of your house. If you're a fan of folklore, you might already know that iron repels fairies. In most stories involving fairies, anytime a cold iron skillet or some cold iron object is brought out, it gets rid of fairies and fairy energy. So let's say you have some dark fairies come into your house. All you need is some iron and they will run away so fast. But yeah, if you want them in your life, iron could actually harm them. Next, you're gonna wanna sit around flowers and plants, which is kind of what we spoke about before. A simple way to create an environment that makes fairies feel welcome and at home is by surrounding yourself with plants and flowers. Nature is attractive to fairies. So if you're setting up a fairy house outdoors, put flowers and plants all around it. Now it says that fairies don't like any chemicals or pesticides, so make sure your garden is free of that. And lastly, it says to carry a rose crystal or something shiny to attract them. Fairies are attracted to shiny, sparkly things. And that is why in most depictions of fairies, especially in folklore and stories, they're always surrounded by pixie dust, which is why I made those pixie dust bracelets. So when people are trying to contact fairies in real life, a lot of the time they have sparkly things, shiny things, they carry around crystals. Apparently there's actually a crystal called fairy wand quartz, which I've never heard of before, but if you have that and you put it by your windows or by your front door in your garden, they will arrive. Right. And I am so excited for today's video because we are going to be talking about the tooth fairy. I love how I had to point at my teeth. <laughs> now let's be real, every single person watching right now has heard of the tooth fairy at least once in their life. I know for me it was much more than that, we actually practiced that whole tooth fairy tradition. And for me it was exciting, it was happy, I just loved losing a tooth so she would come and take it and give me some money. <laughs> but after doing some more research about the Tooth Fairy, I realized that everything I thought I knew about her was wrong. There is so much more history, there is so much more to know, and there are a lot of darker aspects surrounding the Tooth Fairy. And you know me, I love darker aspects of things. Every single video I do, there's always a comment that says, Jessie B, always ruining our childhoods. And guys, I'm not trying to ruin them. I'm just trying to expand your mind so you know more. You could still love what I'm talking about, it's just now, you know, the creepier stuff too.
too. <laughs> In fact, you should be thanking me. All right, so what you may not have known is that there are different tooth fairy stories depending on where you live around the world. So we're gonna delve deep into that history. So let's talk about the tooth fairy that I personally know. This is the tooth fairy that goes to the US and to Canada. When kids lose teeth in the US and Canada, it's customary to put the tooth under their pillow before bed. Some people even have a special tooth pillow that have a pocket for their tooth. Then, kids eagerly wake up the next morning to see what she left them, usually money. Traditionally, the tooth fairy is female, and she usually resembles Tinkerbell from Peter Pan. So to sum it up, we lose our teeth, put them under our pillow, we wake up in the morning, there's money there, and she's supposed to be this cute, tiny, little, pretty fairy. <laughs> now, when the tooth fairy came to visit me, I did a little bit more than what this tradition says. Basically, I would go into my bathroom and I would open the bathroom window just like this much, enough that she'd be able to like wiggle her way through. And then I would close my door only partly, enough to give her like room to walk into my room. And then I would make sure my tooth was at the very edge of my pillow just so she wouldn't get stuck trying to find it. Like I always had the Tooth Fairy's best interest in mind. <laughs> because not many people think to open your window just to crack because how else is she getting in, you know what I mean? So let's move on to different parts of the world. In Mexico, Peru, Chile, Argentina, and Colombia, the tooth fairy is a rat named Raton Perez. He basically collects teeth from children and leaves gifts in return. These gifts don't have to be money, they can be really anything. I also read that sometimes kids put their tooth into a glass of water, and when this fairy rat arrives, he drinks a glass of water, takes the baby tooth, and then leaves. <laughs> he also leaves a gift for the child in the glass. In French-speaking countries, there's a little mouse called La Petite and she's featured in many children's books. It's so interesting how a lot of places around the world, the tooth fairy is actually a mouse. I did not know that. But that blows my mind. So really, is it just Canada and the US that we have an actual fairy and everywhere else? It's a mouse? But not all cultures celebrate the tooth fairy. Some people actually just have weird superstitions surrounding teeth. In parts of Asia and India, children throw their teeth that come from the bottom jaw on the roof and teeth from their upper jaw on the floor. So if you lose a top tooth, it goes on the roof. If you lose a bottom tooth, it goes on the floor. And the idea is that your new teeth will grow in the direction that you threw it. Does that make sense? In the Middle East, children throw their teeth towards the sun in hopes that the sunlight will help the new teeth grow faster. And in Malaysia, kids bury their baby teeth in the ground as a way to return them to nature. And the most interesting tooth tradition comes from Turkey. Parents try to influence their kids' future career choices by having them bury their lost teeth in very important places. For example, if they buried their tooth near a hospital, it would make them a doctor in their future. Or if they buried their tooth near a school, it would make them pursue education, maybe become a teacher, etc, etc. So as you can see, there are so many different ways people think of the tooth fairy, different ways people think of their actual teeth in the mouths. But now let's get into the darker beliefs about the tooth fairy. There are some other legends in Europe that go a little bit creepier. Most of these tooth fairy legends revolve around witches. In some cases, the reason kids dispose of their teeth is so that a witch does not find them. If a witch does find a person's teeth, it was believed that she might be able to gain complete control over that person. So kids were actually terrified that when they lost a baby tooth, a witch would come for them. Excuse me? Imagine being that terrified from losing a tooth. Like your mom's like, oh sweetie, you're growing up. I'm so proud of you. No mom, a witch is coming. There is one old English legend from Lancashire that tells of a witch named Jenny Green Teeth. Jenny Greenteeth was a witch that was said to hide in scum-filled ponds and catch unsuspecting children. Parents would use Jenny Greenteeth as a way to frighten children into obedience. The pond scum in which the witch hides is said to resemble green teeth. 
Jenny Green Teeth is also used to encourage children to brush their teeth, possibly so that their teeth do not become as dirty as the teeth of the old witch. So parents use this witch to scare their children into better dental hygiene. So that's good, I guess. I mean, I would never want to be scared into doing something, but if it works, it works, you know? I also just want to get into some really weird tooth fairy facts. National Tooth Fairy Day is February 28th. Am I the only one who didn't know we had a National Tooth Fairy Day? The average American tooth is worth around $4.13. So that's the average amount the tooth fairy will give you for losing a tooth, apparently. In 1993, there was an actual tooth fairy museum. It was in Deerfield, Illinois, and it was run by Dr. Wells. It was closed down in 2000 after this doctor passed away, but apparently it was quite the sight to see. I mean, a tooth fairy museum? The tooth fairy collects about 300,000 teeth from children all over the world every single night. She's doing a lot of work. All right, let's end off this video with a tooth fairy creepypasta. It's about this father who has a child who loses a tooth. So he tells her to go to bed, put her tooth under her pillow, and wait for the tooth fairy. So she falls asleep, the father goes back into his bedroom to go to sleep, but right before he closes his eyes, he hears this hissing noise coming from his daughter's bedroom. So he walks over to her room, he turns the doorknob, and he realizes her door is locked, which is extremely unusual. But before he starts panicking, he decides to look through the keyhole on her bedroom door. Through this tiny hole, he can see this giant figure standing in his daughter's room. It says it was wearing a burnt gown with some red spots splattered across it. The skin was white as paper, but the nails were as yellow as the sun. But when he saw the face of this figure, that was the most horrid. It apparently had no eyes, yet it was somehow staring at his daughter, and its mouth was extremely widely open, almost about to like gobble his daughter whole. So he freaks out, starts repeatedly kicking the door to try and get in, which obviously wakes up his daughter, she starts screaming. He finally gets into her room, picks his daughter up, looks at this figure and says, what are you? And the figure replies with, why, I am the tooth fairy. And uh, that's how it ends. There's actually different versions of this story. I think another version is where like the father is crazy, it's all in his head, and the father is the tooth fairy. It's like a whole weird thing. I've read like three different versions of this same story. But either way, tooth fairies can be creepy. All right guys, so let's talk about this very strange case. This is what happened to Bridget Cleary. Bridget Cleary was born in 1869 and was said to be very intelligent, beautiful, and independent. She was a dressmaker, a hat maker, and she sold eggs. And she stood out among others because she was literate, which many women weren't back then, and she was relatively well off. She was 18 years old when she met her husband, Michael. He was 20 at the time, and he worked as a craftsman constructing barrels and other goods. They got married, they moved in together, and while many people in the town were living in windowless, mud-walled houses with thatched roofs, they had a beautiful stone cottage with a slate roof and glass windows. So yeah, they definitely stood out. Many of their neighbors said that it looked as though Michael and Bridget had a very happy marriage. The only issue that ever arised was the the fact that Bridget wanted to start making home deliveries for the things that she made, like her dresses, her hats, the eggs that she was selling, usually people would come and pick them up, but she wanted to start offering a service where she would go directly to their house to drop it off. Now, her husband did not like this idea at all. He did not like the independence, but that didn't stop her. Good for her. So on Monday, March 4th of 1895, she left the house to go deliver some eggs to her father's cousin. It was a three mile walk and to get there, she had to walk through this medieval earthen ring fort. It was on Kyle Nagrena Hill, and many people called it the fairy fort. And back in the 19th century, superstition about fairies was still very prominent. According to Irish folklore, they were known as fair folk, which were basically human-sized mythical beings that lived hidden in the world. And like humans, they can be generous, bestowing good favor on those who treat them well, or 
Or they can be evil and vindictive, spoiling milk, damaging crops. Often, if something went wrong in 19th century Ireland, people said it was the fairies doing, so fairies were always blamed. And fairy forts, like the one Bridget passed that Monday morning, were said to be where they lived. Locals believe that if you walk too close to a fairy circle, you might get snatched by a fairy, and they would often take young children or pretty women. It was believed that fairies had trouble producing babies of their own, so they would steal pretty mortals to embolden their line. And when fairies stole someone, they would leave a changeling behind, which was basically a fairy made to resemble the person stolen. So it was like a fairy in disguise, if that makes sense. And often a changeling would be identified or found out because of their strange actions, like falling sick or looking slightly different from the original person. So when Bridget returned from her trip of delivering eggs, she got home and she just could not get warm. The next day she was shivering in her bed and she was complaining about this raging headache that she had. And over the next few days, her condition got worse and worse. Finally, a doctor came to see her and he diagnosed her with nervous excitement and bronchitis. Nervous excitement? Does he mean like anxiety? Like, oh, you're fine, you just have anxiety. So he gave her some medicine and they also had a priest come in to read her her last rites just in case she died. Michael became super concerned for his wife's welfare and began to look for supernatural causes for her illness. He said that his wife looked different. He claimed that she was two inches taller and looked too fine to be his wife. What does that even mean? So he met with this local storyteller who was very versed in fairy lore and he told Michael, that is not your wife in there. And he gave him this herbal cure to give to his wife to turn her back into her original form. So that night, Michael invited over a bunch of men to hold her down onto the bed to force her to take this very strange fairy medicine. He apparently even yelled out, take it you witch or I'll kill you. And to try to drive the fairy out of her, they threw urine all over her. They threatened her with a hot poker. They eventually even burned her forehead with it. So she did end up drinking this fairy medicine because she was literally being tortured. And by the end of the night, she seemed to be back to her normal self. And Michael felt very satisfied with this fairy exorcism. In the morning, Bridget got dressed and invited several relatives over for tea. And they were all sitting around the table and she asked if someone could pass her the milk. In that moment, Michael's paranoia reignited because he knew that fairies were said to crave fresh milk. But dude, you're at a tea party. So in front of the entire family, he grabbed her and tried doing another fairy exorcism. He was burning her skin once again with the hot poker, eventually catching her whole dress on fire. She went up in flames. One of the relatives in the room yelled out, Michael, don't do this. Don't burn your wife. And he apparently responded with, She's not my wife. She's an old deceiver sent in place of my wife. So she died from what was happening to her. And later that night, he buried her in a shallow grave about a quarter mile from their cottage. He spent the next three nights waiting at the fairy fort for the fairies to return the true Bridget. He believed that at any moment, she would come galloping through the ring fort on this white horse and they would be able to be reunited and they would walk back to their house. But the police arrived to him first, obviously, and he was put on trial and found guilty of her death, thank goodness. What's unfortunate about this time in history is that a lot of the women being accused of being changelings were educated women. They were successful women. They were empowered women, literate women. It was women who didn't necessarily fall in line with their husband. There's actually a lot of similarities between women being accused of changelings and witches. Both were a means of punishment for women who stepped outside of society's norms. Women like Bridget Cleary. And so that is the case. And obviously it wasn't fairies who did this to her. She was just becoming more independent and made her husband worried. And yes, maybe he really did believe in changelings and that she was stolen. Still doesn't make what he did right. And it just goes to show you that instead of thinking, oh, my wife's being amazing. Her work is going well. She's delivering products by herself. He thought, no, that can't be her because she can't do that. She must be a fairy. And that's just so messed up to me. 
Anyways, let's go through these comments and see what people have to say about their experiences. Someone said, I used to leave bowls of milk and berries for the ones that listen to me play music. They even mess with me sometimes. Pieces of food I leave to cool go missing and they take my keys and my underwear. I never actually see them though. Okay, that's weird to me because I thought he was about to say that he actually saw them, but his stuff just goes missing. So that could be like, that could be a ghost. That's like what I'm dealing with in my house right now. Someone said, when I was younger, yes I did. But now my son has seen scary little men in our side garden. Scary little men. He's three, but has convinced me it's not his imagination. We leave a saucer of cream out there now. He also sees something regular that he calls the baby owl, and he usually points to the corner of the room and ceiling. Owls have always been around him since birth. In fact, my aunt and I both saw owls at two separate locations the night he was born. He always points out the window at the garden. So that's so interesting. Scary little men. And that sort of comes back to the fact that like dogs, babies, they have just better senses than us and they see more things than we do. You know what I mean? So maybe like little kids, imagine if they could see fairies. That would be so cool. And you guys are probably wondering like, why is this on your Halloween series? Like fairies are really magical and nice. Actually, if you look into fairies and if you remember that whole video I did about fairies, they're actually very mean spirited and not the nicest things ever. I would actually probably be freaked out in real life if I saw them. I'd think they were cute, but they would actually freak me out. So that's why I put it on my Halloween series because honestly, seeing any sort of creature is a little unsettling. When I was 10, I was reading and I was meant to be asleep. My creaky old bed was up against the window and I used the street light or moonlight to read. It wasn't that late when I saw a fairy. My parents were still awake and watching TV. The hallway lights were on too and we lived in a fairly old sloping house where the gap between the bottom of the door and the floor was about 2.5 inches. I saw movement out of the corner of my eye against the light of the hall. In the gap under the door was a silhouette of a fairy. It was a teeny tiny girl whose wings flickered. When I saw her, she ducked behind the corner of the door and then poked her head out and wings out to look at me again. I got out of bed and asked her to please let me see her properly and to not be scared. I got halfway across the room and she was still there. Then I kid you not, my bed creaked so loudly as if someone big jumped on it. I got frightened and whipped my head around to see that nothing was there. I instantly knew she had tricked me and when I turned back, I saw saw her jump away. I ran to the door and threw it open to see a huge moth fly perfectly straight down the hall. I followed it and watched it fly to the tiny bathroom window and crawl out super fast. In my whole life, I've never seen such a smart moth. I told my mom right away, already worried no one would believe me. So even though 15 years later, I have never seen anything like it again, I still believe my 10 year old self. I was a smart kid and I was still convinced. That is really interesting to me. So did this fairy like turn into a moth and fly away? I've actually read a lot of stories online where fairies can turn into things like birds, butterflies, moths. And it's so interesting how this fairy left through the small crack in the bathroom window because when I was a kid, we always left the bathroom window open whenever I lost a tooth to let the tooth fairy in. And I don't know why we chose the bathroom, but it was always the bathroom. We'd creak it open a little bit and she would just like fly into my bedroom. You know what I mean? And I always wondered as a kid, like if the tooth is under my pillow, how is the tooth fairy strong enough to lift my head because like her her body's probably like this compared to my face you know what I mean she's gotta have some some arm muscles. Okay, here's the next one. When I was around 10 years old, I was having a sleepover at my friend's place. Her bed was in the corner of the room running parallel to the wall in which I saw something. I was on a spare mattress on the floor right next to her bed and I was lying in the same position. My friend had asthma, so I had woken up during the night because she was coughing. Above the head of her bed, about 20 centimeters under the roof, it looked like there was a glow in the dark sticker stuck on the wall. It was 2D flat and looked like the side view of a typical fairy you see in kids books. It had its hand on its hips and was kicking its legs, staring straight ahead. I freaked out and woke up my friend. She saw it too and we both had no idea what it was. We hid under the blanket on my bed. Eventually I decided to be brave and I reached over to give the curtain a shake, but it didn't change. It was still on the wall, kicking away. After a while, I don't know how long, I looked again and it was gone. I bravely decided to stand on her bed to feel the wall to see if it was just a glow-in-the-dark sticker, but there was nothing there, no light in the room either. I am now almost 30 and still don't know what happened and have never had anything like that 
that happen again. That is so weird. I'd probably think it was like a glow-in-the-dark sticker as well, but like if you're at your friend's house and your friend doesn't have stickers on their wall and they tell you that, then that's sort of really weird. I don't know about you guys, but when I was a kid, I had those glow-in-the-dark um, star stickers all over my ceiling and I loved it. Because at night when I go to sleep, like that's all you can see when you're lying down. It was so cool and I really miss those stickers. Someone said, when I was a kid, I was very imaginative. I remember once I went upstairs and believed I saw a fairy go into my parents' bedroom. When I followed it, I swore I saw a fairy leaving behind a trail of sparkly dust. Sounds so outrageous, but that's one of my early memories. There was another time where it was dark in my bedroom and I turned over to the dark side of my bed where it wasn't possible that moonlight could peek through my curtain and cast light, but there was a green orb just floating in the corner behind my door. I watched it for a while before calling my parents up. Of course, when they came to see, it was gone. That's like a typical thing with parents. Whenever I was scared at night and called my mom into my room, I'd be like, look over there, there's like a monster. And she'd be like, mm hmm there's not. All right, let's read one more. I believe I have seen two creatures of the fairy type. For the first one, it was nighttime. I'd say it was 9 or 10 p.m. And I was talking to two friends in front of a house. And then I turned around and saw that in the middle of the grass, there was a small humanoid with a plant body looking at me. It had eyes and a mouth. And as soon as I saw it, it was surprised, but it was not afraid. It was looking at me with a proud look. It just gave me a smile. I'm the only one who saw this creature because I didn't tell them about it. I would say that this creature was a pixie. And this is the the encounter that makes me the most curious because I was calm and the creature seemed to know me somehow. And the second time was when I woke up one night and saw a white little elf about 11 centimeters tall on my belly? On your belly? It looked kind of similar to Dobby from Harry Potter, but it was a little bit less ugly, I would say. Aww, Dobby's cute. But he was not looking at me. He seemed to be curious like he was searching for something. He had no fur and had smooth skin and did not wear clothes. I do not remember the rest, but from what I noticed, I was having sleep paralysis. Yeah, probably. I was gonna say like, I might believe the fairy ones, but suddenly if there's like an elf on your belly, that might be you dreaming. I don't know. <laughs> So I first wanted to start off by telling you guys about the very first mermaid that there ever was. This is the Syrian tale of a Targatus. I hope I'm saying that right. She was a goddess who fell in love with a human shepherd, but her divine strength accidentally took his life. Overcome by grief and guilt, she jumped off a cliff and went into the ocean. Now, apparently gods usually turn into fish when they jump into the ocean, but apparently this goddess was just too beautiful for that fate. The transformation stopped halfway through and that's when she became the first mermaid. So obviously half fish, half human, but in her case she was half fish, half goddess. But yeah, that is the tale about how mermaids first came to be, which I find pretty fascinating. So let's talk about the Japanese mermaid. Instead of a half fish, half person, it's actually a half snake, half person. This Japanese myth is known as Nur Ona and she has the face and hair of a woman, but the eyes and teeth of a snake. Apparently, she sits by the shore, cradling a bundle to trick humans into thinking she's a distressed mother holding a baby. So people going past her would think, oh my gosh, there's a woman drowning in the ocean with her child. They say that if they go up to her and take her baby to help her, the bundle will become as heavy as rocks and will pull them down into the ocean. Then, Nur Ona uses her long pointed tongue to drain their blood at a pace that suits her. In some different versions of the tale, she even strangles her victims with her long hair. Then we have another tale from a different part of the world called the Blue Men of the Minch. Scottish folklore tells of a strange group of creatures that inhabit one particular strait. According to legend, they would appear in groups with only their torsos raised out of the water. These Blue Men of Minch would wave sailors in a friendly manner, and the sailors would assume that they were innocent people in need of rescue. But the closer the sailors would get to these men, they would realize that their skin is actually blue and their faces were elongated and twisted and creepy. Unfortunately, sailors close enough to recognize the blue men were close enough to become their prey. The blue men would grab them, drag them into the water and would eat them. So it's interesting to see how these old mermaid tales would make it look like they were in distress in the water and then when people would come to help them, that's it for them. Then we have Irish mermaids. In Irish folklore, selkies are seal women. When these creatures want to go on land, they simply peel off their skins and reveal their human forms. And then they stow their skin behind a rock. Unfortunately for them, 
any man can make a selkie his bride if he steals her skin. As long as he keeps the skin in a hidden place and oils it frequently. So if he falls in love with one of these girls, he has to hide her seal skin and that way she's unable to wear it again and go off into the water. It's so weird. Selkie love stories always end in tragedy for the man because apparently they never stop looking for their skin and eventually they do find it, they put it back on and go back in the water and never come back again. And I guess that's why these men try and hide it so well because they want to keep their wife. It's so weird. It says they inevitably find them and return to sea, never to see their husbands or children again. Then we have what are called mer zombies. In some tales around the world, people believe that men that die at sea and sink down to the bottom of the ocean, they are brought back to life in the form of merfolk. However, apparently these mer zombies have no memory of their life on earth. They sort of just like start over again as fish. But I wonder if they still look like creepy zombies. I have no idea, but this one's kind of creepy. This next one, I feel like I'm gonna butcher the name. I'm sorry, it's called the Ningyo. Ningyo. I think that's right. The Ningyo of Japan are totally different kinds of mermaids than you're probably used to. So instead of a traditional half human, half fish, this can actually take various forms. Apparently it has the lower body of a fish with the upper half of a monkey, or they can have the whole body of a fish with the face of a bird, reptile, or human. But it says that no matter what, they usually have these long razor sharp teeth coming out of their mouth. But yeah, they're like a mixture of a bunch of animals, which is kind of scary. These creatures are more than just awful to look at. They also supposedly possess incredible powers. Apparently if someone eats the flesh of one of these creatures, it will grant them eternal life. There's this one story about a girl who consumed the Ningyo meat by accident after her father left it out. She wound up barely aging but lived for many years, wandering through the world until one day she finally returned to her hometown to pass at the age of 800. So yeah, if you eat them, you live forever. I just saw like a figure pass by my window. I don't know if it was just like the side of my eye or what because Ty's inside, I'm inside, no one else should be here, but something just passed my window. Anyway. <laughs> It was believed that girls who drown themselves because of unhappy love become a Rizalki. According to myth, the first Rizalka was a goddess named Kostroma, and when she discovered that her newlywed husband Kupalo was actually her brother, the goddess drowned herself in a forest lake. She was just so devastated because obviously she doesn't want her love to be her brother, that is just so messed up, so when it was told to her she was just so heartbroken that she drowned herself in a lake and became this version of a mermaid. So Rizalki and Rizalka, one's plural and one's like just one mermaid, if that makes sense. Rizalki are often described as beautiful maidens with pale skin, disproportionately long arms and greenish hair, and they are usually naked, but dressed ones are often depicted as having these torn sundresses on. And the hair of the Rizalki is always loose and long around their bodies, which apparently is a sign of being evil. It was said that regular women would wear their hair up off their face, so whenever you saw a woman with their hair down and kind of crazy like mine, people just knew something was up. They had to be a mermaid. The Rizalki were said to be at their most dangerous during the Rizalka week, which is also known as Green Week. And this would be in early June, like the first two weeks of June. At this time, they were supposed to have left their watery depths in order to swing on branches of birch and willow trees by night, combing their hair with a hairbrush made of fish bones. And swimming during this week was strictly forbidden because Rizalki would drag a swimmer down to the the riverbed. So in the first two weeks of June, they were actually able to leave the water and go on to land, which was so dangerous for people. Some people would go and try to seek out Rizalki to see if they actually existed. So they would go to the edge of the water and would call out for them or would sing songs to get their attention. And this is highly discouraged as they can very quietly swim up to you and grab onto a piece of your clothing or your hair to pull you into the water before you even get a proper glance at them. 
them. So don't try to contact mermaids, they will try to drown you. Now some Rizalki were said to have positive traits as well. It is believed that most of them love children, they try to protect them, they've saved them from wild animals or taken them out of the forest if they're lost, and sometimes they even saved drowning people. But not all of them are good, they're kind of like humans. There's good ones, kind ones, but there's also evil ones. Rizalki were said to have the ability of shape-shifting. It was believed, for example, that they could take the form of squirrels, rats, frogs, birds, or appear in the form of a cow, a horse, a dog, a hare, and a bunch of other animals, which is really creepy because you see animals all the time, and it could be this shape-shifting evil mermaid and you wouldn't even know it. They were also capable of causing storms, devastating rain and crushing hail, while also being able to cause the river to overflow, flooding pastures and crops. They are also said to run faster than any horse and swim faster than any fish. So like I said, if you ever meet one, you're just, they're gonna get you. There's nothing you can do. What I find so fascinating is that there's different kinds of Rizalka, and I'm definitely gonna butcher these names, but I'm gonna try my best here, okay? The first one is called the Vodianiski. They live in ponds and are said to be relatively harmless. But then you have the Laskatuki, and these are dangerous mermaids that are said to haunt the waters. And apparently their name loosely means to tickle. They are said to have very playful personalities and sometimes their jokes go too far and when they see a man, they drag him into the water, tickling him to death. <laughs> when I saw this, I kind of laughed, but also I hate being tickled, so this would be awful. Okay, and then we have the Mavki. These are water and forest spirits that are beautiful and have green hair and transparent backs through which their organs are visible. And they also tickle people to death. Then we have the Bolonitsi, and this is said to be the most beautiful of all the Rizalka. They usually inhabit swamps and marshes. The only ugly thing that spoils their appearance is the fact that they have goose legs instead of a tail. So they use these huge water lilies to hide their legs. And they lure travelers with a sad cry for help and then drowns whoever comes to save them. Then there's the Moriani. They are very tall, they have sea foam hair, and they usually live near coastal cliffs and pose a serious threat to ships. Then there's the Brodenitsi, and apparently these are the kindest of the Rizalka, and they help travelers and they watch over children. And then lastly we have the Lobasti, and these are the most dangerous and vicious of them all. They settle along the banks of rivers and hide in the reeds and thickets. They are described as decrepit old women with sharp claws, and they are as tall as trees and attacks anyone that comes near them. So the other day I was watching The Little Mermaid with my younger cousins and I've always loved Disney movies. In fact, The Little Mermaid was one of the ones that I watched the most. I practically knew every single word by heart, but watching it as an adult definitely gives me a little bit of a different perspective. I started to question everything that I never questioned as a child. There are so many things that are super confusing about The Little Mermaid, so of course I had to share them with you guys. And I think that just maybe you will agree with me on most of them. Number one, how is Ariel's hair always so perfect? Whenever I am underwater, my hair like clumps together and gets all tangled, but her hair is like a beautiful cloud all the time. Even when she gets out of the water to chill on a rock, her hair is not even messy. It's not even wet. It's just blowing in the wind, all dry. I found a photo online that perfectly illustrates what I'm talking about. This was Ariel's hair in the movie, and this is what it should have looked like realistically. So do you get what I'm saying now? Like what is her secret? because I'd like to know. Number two, she falls in love with Eric in like two seconds. I mean, I get he's good looking, but relax girl, you don't know his personality yet. You are singing to a complete stranger. Did your parents teach you anything? Like, is it just me or did the romance move way too fast in this movie? It's trying to teach girls that only looks matter. Like, yeah, the first hot guy you see on the street, you should marry him. You should fall in love with him right there. You should sing to him as well, he would love that. Strangers love being sung to. Number three, Eric Ariel is a hoarder. She is literally portraying that the more material goods you have, the happier you'll be. Like seriously guys, she was a straight up hoarder and she always wanted more than what she had. Her lyrics were literally, I want more. 
Even though she had a full cave full of stuff, she was constantly looking for more things to add to her collection. Think about it. Seriously, she needs to go on TV or something for her issues. Number four. How messed up is it that Ariel's treasure trove includes a fish hook? It's just a little bit messed up if you really think about it. Why is she so excited about fish hooks? Why is she collecting them? They kill fish. She is a fish. That's like me finding something that kills humans and being like, Wow, I should add this to a collection of mine. That's not weird at all. Number five. How did Flounder get Eric's statue into Ariel's cave? This is a question that I would love the answer to. Eric's statue was rock, okay? Heavy rock. How did a teeny weeny fish get that all the way into Ariel's cave? <laughs> Teeny weeny. I'm so mature. But seriously, he has like no upper body strength. His fins are like this. How is he gonna get a giant rock statue all the way into her treasure trove? Tell me. Number six. King Triton is like extremely over controlling and borderline verbally abusive. Like the extent that he flipped out when he found Eric's statue was just unnecessary. Like if my dad came into my room and saw something that he didn't like, usually he would be like, you know what Jess, you should probably probably get rid of that. He wouldn't like go on a rampage and destroy my entire room like Ariel's dad did. He went insane. Ariel's dad needs therapy. And as a kid, I won't lie, I was a little bit scared of him. He was constantly yelling at her and treating her horribly. Number seven, Ariel gave up her voice for a guy. Does anybody else realize how messed up that is? She gave up her ability to speak her mind for a guy she's never met. She's teaching girls that they should go to extreme measures to become some somebody that they're not. What horrible morals! Who made this movie? Come on, Disney. Great influence. Number eight. Ariel made a deal with somebody who was clearly evil. Like, how did she not think that things would go badly? She is an evil witch. She obviously has bad intentions for you. Like, that was not a smart move on your part, Ariel. I am very disappointed in her thought process on that one. Number nine. Why doesn't Ariel just write Eric a letter? <laughs> we clearly see that she is capable of writing when she signs Ursula's little contract thing. So why can't she just grab a piece of paper and a pen at the castle? She could literally write down everything that she needs to tell Eric. Her name, the fact that she's actually a mermaid, the fact that she actually can talk but she's under a spell. She could tell him everything. I mean the solution is so simple that I could pull my hair out. She has three full days with Eric. Isn't that enough time for her to be like, hmm, I can't speak. Maybe, just maybe, I should try and find a pen and paper in this giant castle full of convenient supplies. Number 10. Why can't Max the dog talk? Like literally every single other creature in the movie could. Crabs, seagulls, fish, you name it. Why can't the dog talk? I just need to know. It seems unfair that every single other animal and creature can. That is dog's discrimination. <laughs>